Hello and welcome to this Trader Interview Series. Today I'm joined by John Marriott, UK trader and investor. Thanks for coming on, John. How are you doing? Hi, Michael. Thanks for inviting me on. Um, yeah, all good, thanks. Aching a bit because I did a 14 mile hike yesterday. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> <But> I, <laughs> managed sounds to, painful. I managed to catch up on all my um, podcast, financial podcast that I listen to. So. Yeah, which ones do you listen to? Um, so I listen to the ones that you do with John. Um, well, that's a good start. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of the box market ones. Um, I know John's just started doing some of that as well, haven't he? Yeah. Um, I listened to one called Value Hive, which is actually a US based one. Um, I was originally put onto that because the guy who presents them, which is called Brandon, um, interviewed uh, Robert Mahan. Um, Deep Value. Ah, okay, yeah. On Twitter, yeah, I think that was, when, that was when I came aware of it. But um, he does a the, the presenter does a thing where he just does a he reads out the like quarterly reports from hedge funds over in the states. Mm -hmm. So it gives you kind of an idea what what their thinking is. And oh, he summarised three hedge funds yesterday that were like a complete disaster. They lost an average about fifteen percent over the last quarter. So oh, okay, <laughs> it's, it's maybe not a a sort of good source of ideas at the moment, but if I can show you where things are going wrong. Yeah. yeah so Just going to pause, pause it here. Um, so, so we've had a brief technical intermission there because uh, the sound quality let us down, but I, th I think and I hope it's now fixed. Um, so do, do you want to tell us when, when you got started trading, John, and, and some things that you've learned along the way? Because I actually have no idea when you did start. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think I actually opened a Hardrace Lansdowne account um, about 2015. Mm -hmm. I'd had a decent year with commission at work and I wanted to put some money into there as a SIP contribution to avoid paying a silly rate of tax on it. Um, so yeah, I did that. Um, I've actually got a few friends who are financial advisors, so one of them pointed me in the direction of Hank. Hargreaves lands down and just said to put it into some you know, legal and general trackers that I started out with. And I mean, a FTSE 100 one and a FTSE 250 one. Um, and they were doing okay. But then I um, sort of started having a, a poke around the platform and, and looking at individual stocks and stuff. And ones that I was personally aware of. Um, it was, Girlfriend at the time liked to buy stuff with Boohoo and I sort of noticed their advertising all over the place. Um, they they were doing really well at the time, you know. It was a really strong chart, um, so I sort of buying dips and, and selling rallies in that for a while, which worked out quite well. Um, and then unfortunately, I came across something called Serious Minerals. Um, yeah. Been been from North Yorkshire myself, that um, appealed to me, so I looked into that in more detail, um, put a few quid into that, and that was my first investment. Was in that was just before they did the, the big financing for it, where they did a placing and sort of issued um, bonds and stuff, didn't they? Um, and mm. there was quite a decent discount on there. So I became aware of what a discounted placing was, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably a good lesson to learn early on, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, and then the, the share price of that did actually start coming back. Um, I think it was in, in profit at one time. Um, but yeah, in the fullness of time, it, and got taken quite a decent hit on that position. And so um, that was a good uh, way to learn about risks and, and pitfalls that you come across, particularly on the A market, because that was prior to them um, moving to mid. They moved into the main board, I think, didn't they? Um, I, can't, I can't remember. Um, but they weren't, it, it, was, it got quite large, the market cap at one point, didn't it? I remember it thinking it was, um, I'm sure it was like several hundred million. For some yeah, I think it, grandiose yeah. project across the North Yorkshire Moors, they wanted to dig some special engineering feet tunnel. I think um, it got into the footy two fifty at one point. Did it? Oh, it okay. Over a million quid, I think at one point. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember it getting on there, but um, I think they they blamed Brexit for not being able to find them. So, uh, in the end, so. well, yeah, There's, it's always someone else's fault, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think that was a pretty weak excuse, but then 
Mm. Yeah, Chris Fraser, the guy you see, yeah, I don't think he's got too many friends in the local area because um, I know a lot, a lot of people sort of in the, the locality of Whitby got mm. on board with that project and, and put a lot of money into it, thinking it was a, a sort of sure fire thing, which obviously you know, doesn't exist. Um, yeah. Yeah, so less, lesson learned there. I, I actually sold before the it actually got taken out because um, I thought a lot of people might actually vote out of spite to block that Anglo-American takeover. It might actually end up going into administration, but mm -hmm. it did come here in the end. Um, yeah, so that, that was the starting point. Um, my portfolio's a lot more sensible these days. Um, Good. <laughs> That's the start. Things that require funding to be agreed is, is something I typically avoid these days. Mm. Um, I, haven't, I haven't got burnt there. Um, I did break my own rule with <laughs> a similar sort of stock, actually. I used to own um, Salt Lake Potash, mm -hmm. um, which ended up going to the wall um, down in Australia. They, that was a similar kind of thing, but it wasn't actually an underground mining operation. That was... Um, basically scraping um, SO4 off these salt flats um, that, that evaporate brine and the, the plan was just to, to scrape this product off the surface so there, there wasn't as much, it wasn't as capital intensive. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, yeah, that, that didn't work out. I think they actually ended up doing about six equity placements in a year or something, which is a bit of a red flag. <laughs> um, but the one thing there is that management had actually, the, the chairman particularly, I seem to recall, had actually tipped in a lot of his own money, millions. Um, so that looked like it, it was actually, you know, there was there was courage and conviction there. Yeah. But it, it was totally misplaced as it turned out. So oh, that's a shame. A small um, consolation that management had, uh, had taken yeah. a haircut alongside myself. What, what went wrong there, Then, if it was such a... Such a simple operation. What was the think, issue? I don't think the um, efficacy of the, of the process was what they hoped it would be. So the the okay. yield from the, from the operation of actually harvesting those salts from the evaporation ponds wasn't anywhere where it needed to be. Got it. Yeah. It just wasn't economically valuable. Yeah. I mean, they had done like test testing and stuff um, first, but. Um, yeah, there are there are some other operations that are listed on the Australian board that are doing some similar kind of things. I don't know how they're getting in there, but I remember seeing an article um, online a few months ago that the administrators hadn't had any luck in in trying to palm off the sort of um, what was left of this project. So mm. just to make over the really, yeah. well, so but, um, <laughs> but the. the between mate, between those two investments, um, in 2017, I did actually start taking a position in, in Harvest Minerals, mm. and I was horrendously underwater there for a, an awful long time. I think that got down. I know it's one you're pretty familiar with, but um, yeah, I've got I've got a seven pence average there. And I think it got down to about two and a half pence at one point. Um, yeah, I, I think I remember looking at it at two p. And it, I remember an R and S saying it was going to be profitable, and I just didn't really believe it. Um, yeah, well, I think a lot of people are skeptical. Yeah, um, that I think was fortunately was the biggest position of those um, three fertilizer plays I've spoken about. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that obviously is coming good now. And um, the catalyst for that's been the the war in the Ukraine, unfortunately, um, mm -hmm. where. Um, Belarus was a big exporter of fertilizers, as I understand it. Um, obviously, they've been sanctioned. And then gas is a big input into a lot of fertilizer production, which is obviously yeah. prices up a lot. Whereas harvests are just digging this stuff up and, and milling it. There is no um, gas in production at all. In fact, they've actually built a solar farm on the mine site now, um, which is covering most if not all of their power needs so they're actually I, thought, I think it's all of the power needs yeah, yeah. All of it. so fortunately yeah they're really insulated into the um insulated against the cost of energy so um it's been a bit of a win-win for those at the moment the share price has been a bit weak recently hasn't it i think you got up to about 
Yeah. Depends on what we're down about 11 and a half or something. Like yeah, 11 and a half, 12, something like that. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's a, it's a, it's held mainly by private investors, isn't it? I don't so, think there's any institutions on the phone. No, it's, it's pretty small. I mean, there's a family office with a decent holding, but um, they've been in a long time. Yeah. 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 But that's it. When you've got um, stocks like that, they're, they're at the mercy of, of sentiment because, yeah. Um, you know, when it was at 18p, I think now it's a much, they've had much better news flow since, um, you know, confirmed sales and things like that. Obviously, the, the gas price has gone even higher. So lots of companies now have just stopped producing yeah. fertilizer full stop. So the macro couldn't be any better for that stock. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, I mean, there, there hasn't been, touch wood, there hasn't been a play. They raised a lot of money, didn't they, when they, when they did last go to market, but that was that was years ago now. That that was 2018, and it was at 18 pence. Yeah, yeah. and they've not raised any money since. No, so I mean, institutional shareholders haven't really had the opportunity to actually get onto the, the mm. shareholder register, have they? Um, no. I expect if somebody did want to take a sizable position in there, then they'd actually take the price up quite a quite lot with that purchases. Yeah, because yeah, it's not the most liquid stock. So. Mm. Uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, it won't, the, the success of the business won't be all die by years on the shareholder register. No, in, in the fullness of time, you would imagine uh, it would be reflected. Um, but we we both own this stock, am I correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, I've been still. in since 2017. I'm, I don't think I've ever sold a share in it. And ah, okay. Away, so. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm currently long, so obviously talking my own book. Yeah. Uh, so full disclosure there. Um, so yeah, that's um, made up for the losses that I made elsewhere in that sector. Fortunately, that's um, good. Yeah, so, but it, patience definitely been rewarded. I think that's the, the longest um, held stock in my portfolio. Um, let's say mm-hmm. held it five years or more now. So yeah, it's patience quite finally a long before. time. <laughs> I know you've been in that quite a few times. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I bought um, a chunk between four and a half to five. I was all out with 13. But I've, I've recently started buying back uh, around yeah. 10, 10 and a half to 11. Mm. I think I bought more last week, higher as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's holding support. It, it's got huge tailwinds behind it. Could be wrong, um, but I think the, the risk to reward is, is quite attractive. Yeah, I, I don't know the Brazilian political situation too well, but I mean... They've got it's Bolsonaro at the moment, isn't it? And I'm sure there's been no idea. Yeah, he's the way he's quite a he's quite a right wing leader. Um, whereas I think there's quite a big socialist movement in Brazil as well. So it's entirely possible the political landscape could totally change at some point. So I suppose that's a risk, particularly when you're talking about mining. If you know there's a strong environmental influence in the new government. Thing the attitudes to mining might change all that, but I mean that's the risk my ignorance out there really. But it's just yeah, I have thought of him, so I'm not overweight, but I've got a, a decent chunk to make a difference to them um, mm. portfolio. So I, th- yeah, I think there was, I think there was an instance with um, that uranium play in Spain. But I own that one. Yeah, I'm starting. What, what's it called? Um, Barclay Energy. That's the one, yeah. And yeah. they, they de- declined the, I think they'd got permit after permit and then suddenly it was declined. Um, yeah, it's the it's the very last one that they're only waiting for one more permit. Mm. I think it's the, but without it, they can't do anything and that's, unless they get it, the, the project's completely worthless. Yeah, and I think there are quite, there's quite a strong environmental um, voice in, in the Spanish government who mm. are opposed, so... Um, Barclay's position is that they're, I think they're taking legal action saying there's sort of no legal basis for denying this permit but I mean they would say that wouldn't they well yeah <laughs> they would and then there was one rock hopper last week they won 180 million euros from the Italian government because they told them they weren't allowed to drill 
some asset or something in 2016, something crazy like that. Oh, and they actually won that, did they? They actually won, yes. Yeah. So oh, right, okay. I like heard a, um, a share price spike. Yeah, yeah, I heard something about that on one of the Fox podcasts I was listening to the other day because I think um, Ascent Resources are actually they've and got they're a suing different Slovenia, different yeah, Slovenia, yeah. <laughs> mm. Um, so yeah, I think it's on a big sort of no win, no fee kind of deal. Yeah. Um, that's I think that's what Rock Hoppers was, yeah. Right. But just goes to show there's a real government risk in any commodity play that's well in any country. I mean, even in the UK, there's there's companies that have been uh told not to frack, things like that. So yeah, def definitely governmental risk is, is something to be aware of. Yeah. Um yeah, talking about fracking, even closer to home, um, Rearbold resources mm. claim to have a, a really big um, resource, don't they? Sort of East Yorkshire kind of way. Um, whether anything will come of that, I don't know, but they're saying it's one of the biggest onshore finds in the UK for a number of decades. Okay. So I, I used to hold that. In fact, I've still got a really small number of shares, but there is a bit in my girlfriend's portfolio. So uh, I know it's just, it's come back a little bit, obviously, with gas prices, but. It's always when they get it out of the ground, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, it costs a lot. And there's so many things that can go wrong. Yeah, um, yeah. But so I, do you do you mostly trade commodities? Is that your no, not or? not at all. My, port, my portfolio is fairly balanced. Um, I'd say the thing I've been most successful over the years is actually financials. Mm -hmm. um, so I've recently exited um, Begbie's trainer and yeah. FRP advisory, but those were FRP was my biggest position until I sold that a month or so ago. Um, yeah, so those, um, what I've still got in the portfolio, um, K3C, mm -hmm. um, which has um, like an advisory restructuring arm to it, and that makes up about 50% of their revenues, and then they do like they're a bit like an, the other half of the business, a bit like an estate agency for selling small businesses. So you, if you're wanting to, to sell your business, you can list it with them and they'll kind of tout it out and try and find you a buyer. Right. Um, put deals together. Um, but yeah, they seem to have quite an enthusiastic management team who deliver on what, they've, um, on what they say they'll do. So yeah, that's one I, I quite like. Um, they pay a dividend, um, don't have any debt. Oh, net cash certainly mm -hmm. and share price is, is languishing a bit which is perhaps surprising considering that they've got their counter cyclical half of the business and um, whereas you look at uh, the share price of frp and begbie still they're quite close to all-time highs whereas mm -hmm. a3c is well well off that their highs and the same that the sort of more cyclical part of the business, I suppose, is actually still got a really positive outlook. So, and mm -hmm. um, that's what we're looking to add to. If anything. So, um, yeah, so fi financial services has always been quite good to me. I suppose I only really deal in UK markets. And, yeah, so you know, Brit Britain is sort of has a reputation for being strong in that area, doesn't it? So it seems like uh, an obvious kind of sector to play in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think I tend to avoid them, but it's mainly because I just don't understand right. the business models. But smaller, small caps, yeah, um, I'll trade those. Yeah, I remember you pointing out FRP. That was a really nice breakout. Yeah. Um, I think Begbie's is, it did break out and it's come back. So it's sort of retesting that level. Um, yeah, um, I sold FRP um, because they previously mentioned that they could afford to take on a lot more business with the current staffing level. Um, so you'd expect to see operational leverage as those staff became more busy, basically. Um, mm -hmm. So the revenues would go up whilst the payroll um, stayed largely the same. But with the last lot of results that came out, um, they'd taken on quite a lot more staff. And I dare say that, you know, because of wage inflation, they were paying more as well. And although revenues had gone up, profits hadn't kept pace with that. So the, the gross margin on my work had actually gone down quite a bit. So ah, okay. the investment 
part of the investment case for me was broken, really. So whether or not they're appointing loads more staff because they're expecting an absolute avalanche of insolvencies and administrations and stuff, time will tell. But um, they only said they were in line with expectations and market expectations are only for another 10% of revenue, which you know, given mm. it was on 20 times earnings, I thought it was a little bit underwhelming, I think. Yeah, well, if you've been paying 20 times, you expect uh, something a bit punchier, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that looked pretty fully valued for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, a fairly similar story at both pieces. Yeah. yeah. So are you mostly a trader, John? Or are you more of an investor? Or how, how do you see yourself and how long um, is your typical holding time? Really varies. I've been known to day trade before. Like I said, I'm... I'm holding Harvest Minerals from been long since 2017. So. Yeah, I, th- I think you could call yourself an investor there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's quite long. Yeah, like I exited Scenic this morning. I think I've only been sat on those for a matter of months. Mm-hmm. Um, decided I didn't like the financials that came out this morning. So that went. Um, I'm actually up to 21, so cash now. Right. Is that a lot for you, typically? Yeah, or? I've normally got itchy fingers. Um, yeah. <laughs> if I sell I something... That feeling. Yeah, if I... Certainly before, like, if I sold something in the morning, it was often gone by the end of the day and almost certainly gone by the end of that week. Into yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think I can afford to be patient in this market like that. I know the stock market looks ahead and stuff, but... The, there's so many risks on the table at the moment, isn't there? Um, yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of uh, headwinds and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was I was looking at um Mitchell and Butler's um last lot of results. They're not that recent, I think came out a few months ago, but um they were actually totally littered with um sort of talk about going concern. Mm-hmm. Um and you know. From personal experience, just going into pubs these last few weeks, I don't know what it's like down in London, but they they pretty been... pretty raging still, yeah. Oh really? Well, oh, okay. it depends. I mean, I haven't been in the city for a few weeks, but where right. I live, it's the the pretty busy. Yeah. Okay, because I was in my local the other Saturday night, and they'd actually paid the pay per view to have the boxing on when I'm in Joshua's mm-hmm. world title fight, and um. It was still really quiet, even though they had that on. Oh. Oh, um, okay. That's not that's no good for them. No. And then, you know, I went out for a couple of pints bank holiday Sunday night as well. And similar kind of story. It was it was really thin. So oh. um yeah, the Mitchell and Butler's results were talking about, you know, all the obvious stuff, squeeze customers, food inflation, energy yeah. inflation. Um I guess the unknowns are with a new incoming prime minister, what mm. they actually do. Are they going to, you know, just help voters or are they going to help businesses as well? Um, I know the, the pub industry as a whole have been sort of lobbying government for support, as I understand mm. it. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you, I was really surprised when I didn't see any institutional shorts on Mitchell and Butler's when I checked that on Short Tracker. Um, I guess the risks are, yeah, they could get a boost from government assistance. And I'm conscious that Green King got taken out just before COVID hit. Yeah. So maybe there's some kind of takeover risk there as well. Mm. But It's also maybe, pretty liquid as well. I don't think it's the most liquid of stocks. Oh, really? Yeah. I've, I've traded it a few times and it's... it's that FTSE 250 then, got it. There's a lot of these FTSE 250 companies are quite thinly traded, even though they can be hundreds of millions and just nobody really cares. I know it's surprising, but I've found it not the not the most liquid of stocks. Okay. And then JD Weatherspoons, they've been losing money as well. Uh yes, yeah, so I'm short JD Weatherspoon. Okay. Yeah, it's I mean it's it's probably gonna do quite well. I mean if a lot of these independent companies, there was, a, there was an article in The Guardian the other day saying, or was it The Times, 70% of pubs could close. Probably an overestimate to, to generate clicks. But, you know, we've seen on, on Twitter, small businesses saying our energy has gone up five five times. 
well, yeah. obviously we can't afford to stay open. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and companies who can tap shareholders for cash, you know, will survive and hoover up a lot of these units. Yeah, up. that's true. Um, you know, I always think like value brands tend to hold up quite well as well. Like mm-hmm. yeah, B and M and um, yeah, uh, I think the squeeze middle is a very real thing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, that's it. Luxury goods tend to do well. Yeah, because people who can afford them generally don't see much of a turn down. Um, and it's it's the middle the middle classes that tend yeah. to get hit, and then. Yeah, so I'd be looking at already things buying like, it. Yeah, restaurant anyway. group, I would have thought. Yeah, I'm short restaurant it, group as well. Right, okay. Yeah, I, I just I just hate that company so yeah. much with a passion. I mean, I don't even know who could ever eat at Frankie and Benny's. They even <laughs> opened one in Hartlepool. Um, <laughs> right, okay. and, and kids go free, apparently. But obviously, there's a lot of kids in Hartlepool because of, of teenage parents. Um, I think it was even in the capital of Europe. For teenage pregnancies at one point right but frankie okay. and benny's couldn't even last there and it's gone um you know which pretty much just says how bad it is and uh yeah, yeah they overpaid for wagamama as well yeah. which is a i don't don't really raise it i i just think the whole brands are fatigued and there's a lot of optimism in that share price even yeah. at 40 pence but as i say could be wrong if as, yeah. you, and as you've mentioned as well john if they get an energy bailout then who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think some of these obvious trades do have merit. I mean, it's pretty obvious City World were going bust for it. It was only a matter of time, wasn't it? And like, yeah. I, but I mean, that, that took two years at least for it to, to go bust. Yeah. Um, the only trouble with these really things that have really, really been kicked down is that you only need sort of some kind of technical rally and you can find mm. yourself in 100% underwater on a short cart in, in the space of a week. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, the cheaper something gets, the more attractive it is to somebody else. Um, and in the age of sort of meme stocks and mm. Reddit crowd and stuff, you never know if when they might jump on something. Yeah, but I mean the the slow trade though. If you know Weatherspoons, it got up to about fourteen quid at one point, and now it's below five. And when you look at the chart, it's just constantly trending downwards. So yeah. There was plenty of time to get short um, and and add to your position, but yeah, it's it's people don't really tend to think about shorting until everyone's thinking about shorting, um, and it, it's hard shorting stocks because the you know it, until April this year, I think everything was on fire, even though it was glaringly obvious we were going to enter a, a big recession. Yeah, but nobody cared. Yeah, because there were some really big rallies to come coming out of COVID, wasn't there? Mm. Um, from pub chains and stuff. Yeah, um, pretty much everything rallied. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, my, my record in shorting is is really good, but I, I generally take smaller position sizes compared yeah, to same. things I'm long on, because um, I am worried about. I've never got. I don't think I've ever been on the wrong end of a takeover bit with anything, mm. but it, it is something I'm conscious of. Yeah. Um, so no, I did okay out of Fever Tree because, um, you know, they were just on a, a really punchy multiple with, with obvious mm. headwinds and stuff like that, the on trade and stuff. Um, and then it you know, came out about the, the cost of glass, which is something that I'd never even considered. But yeah, yeah, me neither. I mean, there are. Yeah. Many surprises to the upside in the economy at the moment are the like the, the chances are if you miss something it's probably you know a negative to that company. So. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So that was I, a good I, shot. Yeah. Unfortunately, it hit my target price before the last lot of results came out, so I took profits, and then um, I think that day when the results dropped, it it went down a lot. It was it down like it did it, on the I day. Was, it was down quite heavily. Um, yeah, down to about 800 p something. Yeah, but I mean, it opened quite high, you know. I think it dropped, it opened at nine and then dropped dropped a quid. But it rallied, and I think by the end of the day, it, it re- recovered most yeah. of the, the intraday fall. Yeah. Um, which was which was surprising to me. But and now it's like not back. it's not done much better since. I think it's around 900 now. Yeah. But that's still probably on a 
a decent PE, I would have thought it'd be. Probably, oh, yeah. Oh. Maybe we should even be looking at uh, hitting it again. Yeah. So the, the only one I am short on at the moment is right move, and that was just on valuation. Um, mm. I was looking mainly just to sort of hedge the market a bit. I didn't want to short FTSE 100 because it's full of commodities. Um, yeah. So I looked at right move. That was on about 30 times earnings, and I read the outlook, and it was like, we're probably going to hit expectations, but expectations are only for about 10% revenue growth. Mm. Um, so I thought, well, I might might miss them a bit. And even if they hit them, like, I don't really see the, the bull yeah. case there. So, I'm, yeah, it's fallen a little bit since I've, um, I've taken that position out. But I just thought it's, you know, it's a, li- a liquid stock, small spread. If the market does sell off, then I'd expect that to, to fall with it. If, if maybe yeah. Not. A bit more than the market itself so yeah it's kind of a, a market hedge um that's covering my spread bet account and then i've got like i say i'm 21 percent cash in in my in my main account at the moment so um at least i've got a bit of firepower if, if things do take a ton yeah I, th- I think it's always wise to have some bullets in the chamber because things can fall quite quickly and then the trade is suddenly to to go long. Um, I mean, who knows? Um, Ukraine have obviously, as of recording, taken the offensive now in uh, Kherson. Don't know how successful it would be, but you know, if the war ended, that would be a big catalyst for a risk on market. Um, yeah, obviously I mean, it's not the... going to solve everything, but it would be something. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you don't know if if. There's people working in the background in the Kremlin who, who want rid of Putin and might yeah. wake up to one day as a headline that he's, he's been put in jail or someone's put a bullet in his back or you just don't know, do you? Yeah, um, well, I'm not going to say anything about him just in case the KGB are listening <laughs> and uh, decide to kill us. So, uh, you know, I guess, yeah, <laughs> don't say um, anything bad about him. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot, a lot of left field stuff could happen. Um, I've not really read about it but there's something in the news this morning about um oil coming out of iraq i uh, miss, must have missed that right okay yeah and then they're um threatening um producers in the kurdistan region which is ganel and um gulf keystone, gulf keystone yeah yeah um, so I need, I need to look into that a little bit more but yeah there was something about Oil been restricted coming out of one of the ports, so I guess that might tighten the oil market. I know Brent's back above 100. Yeah, yeah. I'm not an oil expert, though, so I tend to just trade the actual stocks. No, ne- ne- neither am I, not, not at all. But, um, yeah, there's all these. I'm always worried what OPEC decide as well, so I got absolutely stuffed in COVID um, when they said they were going to up their production, didn't they? Or maintain their production when mm. demand had obviously collapsed because they were basically trying to bust all the um, American producers by driving the price down. Yeah. And I was like leveraged up in BP shell. Oh, no. <laughs> point, I think the announcement was on a Sunday night when all the markets were closed. I was basically just waiting to find out how hard. Oh, I remember that now, yeah. Air. And I had a massive gap up. Was it yeah. a gap down? It was a massive gap, wasn't it? I gap, oh yeah, gap gap down on all the on all the producers. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because I'd seen when the oil market had opened late that Sunday night, and obviously Brent had gap down loads, mm. and I had to wait for London to open to see how hard BP and Shell yeah. and get hit, and then. Um, yeah, it's that classic Mike Tyson quote: "Everybody has a plan to get in the face." And uh, it's true. Yeah. I was an absolute mess that Monday morning. Like I couldn't make a decision. I was just I lost so much money on leverage. And uh, mm. yeah, that's. Uh, what what did you do in the end? Did you just leave it, or did you close well, it? I out think or? I actually had guaranteed stops in place on some of them, which took me out. But because oil had been so volatile, I'd not like tighten them up before market close on Friday. So yeah. You can probably have a, a guaranteed stop on likes of BP and Shell five points away from the spot price on in the market, but I, I hadn't set maybe fifteen or twenty percent away, so I still got a real hiding. Mm. 
um, and they were quite big leverage positions, you know, relative to my overall size of my account. So, yeah, I didn't blow the account up, but so given That's all good. the money I had to like add to it and stuff, I'd have probably been better off blowing it up. Mm. <laughs> yeah, lesson learned. So, yeah, leverage is is quite quite dangerous. I mean, it, it's really good when things are going well, but yeah. Yeah, you can really do do yourself some damage. Yeah, uh, which I have done right. before. Um, I've done done. I, th- I can't remember what stock it was on now, but I started averaging down on the profit warning, and yeah. ended up blowing like six months of P and L in about two hours. It's so easily done. Yeah, when you're, you're when you're overexposed, uh, particularly mm. if you're getting like a margin call, I just find the pressure leads to making a bad decision. Like, yeah, I I don't. I think I'm quite methodical in the way I'm thinking about things and quite logical about it. But when I'm put on the spot like that, I just go to pieces. I think you've, mm. you've got to know what your own weaknesses are and and try and you know reduce the risk of those by not putting yourself in that situation. In the first yeah, place. definitely. I think that's that's a good good piece of advice. Yeah, I mean, if you're getting margin calls, it basically means you're way too overexposed. Yeah, and your risk management is well could be a lot better sometimes things happen through no fault of your own everyone takes a big loss because that's just a hazard it's it's unfortunate some stocks are going to go to zero some of them are going to warn yeah um, but yeah it shouldn't shouldn't really be a, a common thing. so on your account you know when it says like the percentage of available capital you've got used mm-hmm. what what sort of level do you try and keep that at? what are um, you comfortable with so I, I usually just put money when I need it into right, the okay. account. So I don't yeah. really you now withdraw it to fund another account. But I've got a couple of spread bet accounts for various strategies. So, but I'll, I'll never, I'll never go like really above seventy five right. often yeah. because then if something happens, then I've got to quickly fund it, and I just don't really want to do that. So in yeah. that sense, I could get margin called, even though I'm really not in terms of exposure, if that makes sense, because yeah. the cash just isn't there. But, yeah. And then other times it, it might be. So yeah. basically I track all of the exposure in an Excel sheet, Yeah. which, which helps. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. But I'm never going... Uh, like this year i'm not leveraged at all um okay. last year i was pretty hard on it um so I, uh, typically i was pretty much always over 100 percent invested a lot of the time close to uh, 130 150 uh so i guess 1.5 x right but now it, i just i don't need to use it and it's also pretty hard to use it I, can't really so when you say you're, you're not leveraged, does that mean what you're only using your account for a few shorts? Or so, um, so I'll trade leveraged products, but the exposure um, is not over the book value or the cash value of the account. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, every position I have, I can actually pay for. Yeah. Um, so even if, yeah, as I say, one account will get a margin call. It's not really a margin call because I can actually pay for it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think it's it's very important to track because it's really easy just to go two times leverage and not really know either. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm cool. always aware how much of an exposure I've got. But I've, yeah, like I said, particularly when it came to oil at the start of COVID, it, it, it mm. was just it was too much. I wasn't. Um, well, I don't. Nobody expected OPEC to do that, did they? Like, no. Nah. If there'd been that kind of expectation, there wouldn't have been such a gap on the chart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those things are just the 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 horrible parts of trading, where you you sort of read it and you you know you're going to lose a lot of money, and there's not really much you can do about it. It's uh, it's not great. Yeah, and then came. I remember I was. I, I had my mum down that weekend and she, she stayed down at my place on a Sunday night. We sat doing the pub quiz, I think, when the, when the oil market opened. Mm, <laughs> I, was oh, like, no. I just looked at my phone and went totally white. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you oh, don't, no. but that's a great example of sort of allowing trading to 
sort of encroach onto family life, isn't it? Mm. And you know, your your overall happiness, which is is something you don't want to do. If that's happening, then you're doing something wrong, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I've I've been in that position before. Um like 2017 where I was losing money hand over fist because I was leveraged and I didn't really have a proper strategy at that point and I, I just wasn't a, a very nice person to be around I was grouchy irritable snapping at my wife yeah. um and yeah and I had this like feeling in my stomach as well and my shoulders felt really tight yeah um because I basically I was a rabbit in the headlights and I didn't yeah. really know what to do i'd never i'd only ever make money in the market and it was like really easy to do so right. um and then one at one point i just thought right i'm selling everything i don't care if it's the bottom um i've made enough so that i can continue to do this full time but if i continue losing i'm just not going to be able to do that yeah. um and then that sort of taught me risk management i guess yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely it's it's pretty everyone learns it i think once everyone has that big loss once because it's, it's easy to listen to people say oh cut your losses and manage your risk you know everyone pays a lot of lip service to it but until you've actually been through that moment it's you don't really understand it yeah um yeah i mean i, I know you're very disciplined on sort of a, a short-term base and if you see something heading south you you're quite happy to cut it where yeah i will i typically only try and act on like i wouldn't sell something because sentiment's turned or or rarely would i do that particularly if i've gone in with a, a longer term view but like as long as the business case holds up and the fundamentals are still solid then hmm. I, I'd, I'd probably be looking to add um and sort of you know back back my conviction and Space Harvest mm -hmm. Minerals is a, is a good example. I mean, yeah, you know, you know been been averaging probably in the teens when it was down at oh, you know double digits when it was down at two and a half pence. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's quite a, a thorough examination of your resolve, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, Sometimes it does pay to down and you're, you're averaging down. Yeah, can be can be yeah. great, I guess. So yeah, if you do back things like I was, so I was listening to this podcast with a. The hedge fund um, quarterly reviews and and some of those guys were were doubling down on positions that they were convinced would make the right call and so mm -hmm. the only time can be the judge but when you are talking about time frames and it's all right saying I'm, I'm well up on harvest now but if you've been holding since 2017 there is the opportunity for us to take into account as well isn't there like you yeah money on other things yeah, I think that's one of the things that people forget is is the opportunity cost. Um, because there's there's like over two thousand stocks in London alone. So you know if something's going sideways or down, um, especially if it's in a stage four downtrend, you can usually you know cash is usually better. Just hold the cash. Yeah, and that will outperform the position if it's a stage four. Um, but then you could actually put that cash into somewhere else and generate even more efficiency on it by making a profitable trade yeah i don't know about you but i, I when i wash my hands of a stock i can often find it quite hard to come back to um, i used to yeah 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 but if i'm taking usually taking small losses on a stock right um but yeah if i've taken a pretty big loss it's i'm always aware of Am I actually revenge trading? Yeah, here? yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, or or even if you, I book profit. Like I remember, I had quite a decent position in in Folex once, and I sold that for quite a decent profit. And I looked this morning, and that's up over a hundred percent since where I exited. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's probably still on quite a reasonable uh, rating. So. Would I go back into something like that, paying over twice as much as what I sold it for before? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I've ever done that before. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I've ever done it with a hundred percent, but I've definitely done it with lots of breakout stocks. So I'll trade yeah. a breakout, sell, then usually it will carry on going, and it will do another base, and I'll buy it again. Yeah. And I'm actually so buying it. Like anchoring bias or something like that. When yeah, you, you you anchor yourself to the price that you paid. Yeah, which but, is meaningless, really. In the yeah. Market, isn't it? 
yeah, the market doesn't really care what we paid. But I tend to see it as I'm looking for a specific pattern that will give me a higher probability. So the price is actually just meaningless. Yeah. It's, um, you know, you're just pressing buttons on a video game, trying to capture a move based on probability. Yeah. Um, and I think when you think of it like that, it becomes a bit easier. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's probably, sounds like you were more like an investor than John. Than a trader. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, some of our long-term investments have probably been short-term trades that have gone wrong. <laughs> mm. Yeah, we've all done it. I think yeah. everyone's got a few of those, haven't they? Yeah. yeah um, done that I, I have been trying to reduce my number of holdings, actually, for probably the last 12 months or so. And the um, best way I've found it just, is just stop buying stuff. Yeah. So I've actually I used to make sure I was awake for seven o'clock on the dot and read pretty much every trading update and stuff on that came out that morning. But mm -hmm. because I've been I've I've become a little bit lazy, but it's kind of made that process of reducing the number of holdings yeah. more effective because you know you get something ahead of expectations no matter what sector they're in or how much knowledge you have of that stuff, it's always tempting to throw a few quid at it, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I find doing that, my portfolio could start sprawling pretty badly. So, uh, yeah, I've been having the odd lie in now again and <laughs> just um, sticking to stuff that's, you know, I'm already holding, I was already on my watch list. Mm -hmm. Seeing how they're getting on. But, um, I mean, do you think it's a, a trader's market at the moment? I think so, yeah. Um I mean, I actually did do what you've just said on uh, Braemar shipping okay. this morning. So I bought so that. To that right? um, it's done all right today. I'll probably sell it within the next few days. I can't imagine it turning into a right. long-term hold. So um, why? what was the reason behind that? So, so that was, it, it massively beat expectations. The outlook was good. Right. Bro gapped up and broke through to a five-year high. Right. Um, so well, that, that was a catalyst for the trade. I don't actually know what the company does. Right. I, was I guess that. shipping services. Yeah. Whatever, I don't, whatever that I, means. I don't know if they own ships or just like a brokerage. For... No, me neither. And it's it doesn't really form a basis of the trade because it's right. just a a pattern. Yeah. But how, how many stocks do you typically own? I, I, I didn't have a count up prior to coming on this, but. Um... I suspect I'm less than 30 now, probably somewhere in the, around 25, I would think. But okay, that's quite a lot. I would I would say the top, my top 10 positions are probably two thirds, maybe a bit more of, of my portfolio. Right. Um, so quite quite concentrated with a long tail of small positions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my biggest, well, my biggest position is cash. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say at 21 percent at the moment. The biggest holding um, is diversified energy. Right. So that's probably about exactly 10% of my overall portfolio. It's actually about, it's all in the SIP. I think it's about 15% of the SIP just because there's no withholding tax on the quite chunky dividend that they pay if you hold it in the SIP. Where right. You end up paying maybe 10 or 15% if it's in an ISA. And then, um, so, but that's been doing well. Um, yeah, I can reason. imagine in this this market. Yeah, yeah obviously it, it, it is gas, um, but it, it's very they hedge, so it's actually quite a leveraged company, which isn't my typical thing. Um, but it's it's very hedged, so they've maybe got ninety percent of their next twelve months production hedged, so they're not actually that sensitive to short term ah, okay. right. movements in the spot gas market. Mm. But the longer gas stays higher for, as those hedges start rolling over, then the new hedges are taken out at a higher level. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So, yeah, the longer energy, the longer gas is, is higher for, the, the better that will do um, because they're not the hedges aren't costing them as, as much money. And then even if the gas market starts going back down after a, an elevated period. Then they'll actually be insulated against that for the next sort of 12, 24 months or longer. Yeah, that, ma that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I really like that. I mean, it's got its detractors over like ESG because there's 
methane emissions and stuff. Bluebird did a bit of a hit piece on them a while ago and it, it took them down to about 80 pence, which I, and it rebounded really sharply from them. So anyone who bought mm. that particular I think they're about 130 now. Um, and then, the, you know, there has been a little bit of financial engineering. Yeah. The, the, the CEO or exec chair or whatever is is keeps putting money in. Um, That's you know, usually a good sign. Seven yeah. figure sums. Yeah, it is. It's kind of like a family business, um, although it's, it's expanded a lot through acquisition. Um, you know, the the uh, the CEO is the um, is the founder, so mm-hmm. um, you know, it's a fairly informal outfit. Like they do the <laughs> investor presentations, and they're all sat around this table in Texas, whatever, <laughs> pretty relaxed. Like they were nothing rusty off and in sort of lumberjack shirt and and Levi's or whatever. <laughs> You know, he, he really knows his business. He's obviously very passionate for it. And mm-hmm. CEOs, Eric's a, a very likeable guy. And, um, I think you can just get a feeling for management sometimes, can't you? And, um, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, they're, they're ones I like. Um, as I long like, as they're not a, a bit of a, a snake oil salesman, though. Because um, some people do get taken in by charming people who are, who are rogues, unfortunately. Yeah. I am. Um, so if you've got a yeah. good judge, then yeah, I guess it's helpful. But if not, yeah, then, I think if they were looking um, to make a fast book, they probably wouldn't have have kept on hedging the gas yeah. uh, production when it was at, at quite a depressed price. They were they were taking a very much sort of safety first attitude with it. Where if it was a new CEO who'd come in and been promised loads of options, like he might be just mm. willing to take the punt on hoping his bet come off and he'd cash those options in and then. Um, yeah, you know, I'll go to hell in a handcuff. <laughs> all he's lost is his job. Mm. Um, whereas, yeah, I mentioned I'd, I'd done scenic this morning. Um, it's not not one I've held for a long time, but I was kind of going through the Twitter feed of the CEO and stuff, and he was doing an awful lot of jet set into like Davos and talking oh, no. about <laughs> UN meetings and stuff, presumably all on his expenses. Um, mm. that was, and then there was loads of adjustments in the financials and oh, you know, that's a killer. Was a, adjusted EBITDA was front and centre and if you actually went down the income statement they were actually making a, a financial loss um, and then there was there was something in there that was below the line and it was something like um, financial losses that may materialise or something and it was on <laughs> some currency hedges and it, one of them, I think, was like eight point something million US dollar, so oh. eight point um, something million dollar loss that was below the line. Um, and you're just thinking, yeah, well, if you've got to draw the line in the sand of your couch, why is that below the line? Like it is, yeah. it is a loss <laughs> on that account. <laughs> yeah, I exactly. guess you always got to check the the adjustables and see what is actually. Um happen but it's, it's also a good point to if you can find a ceo's twitter feed you know see see what they're doing and see what they're posting about yeah so it just, yeah. i'm not saying it's a bad stock but it, and it the revenues are growing really nicely but it, mm. it just didn't smell quite right to me yeah and, well, they, sometimes that's and they were mean. making some really positive noises and the chart just wasn't responding to it so i guess i'm i'm not alone in my thinking but, um, yeah yeah it's not really moved very much i've traded it before but it seems to give it back yeah, every time. I mean, I don't think adjusted EBIT does a red flag in, in every situation. Like, there's um, amortization, like, is a, a genuine um, cost of thing. Yeah, to take away because you know it, you just write it down that um, previous acquisitions on some things like Brave Bison's an example of that. Mm. Um, since the new management came in, they're like still writing down um, acquisitions by the previous management and stuff. So I think it was a bit of a Dobbs breakfast before, wasn't it? But yeah, I've been really now. Yeah, I've been really pleased with those. They've um, set reasonable expectations and and exceeded them, and you know they're really aligned with shareholders. Um, they're quite posh, but some people don't seem to like that. But I don't see any reason to. Yeah, they it seemed all right when when I yeah. spoke to them at Mellow. So uh, didn't didn't really think they actually seemed posh. So. Yeah, um, I mean they're they're quite a young management team, and given that they're in the 
um, sort of social media advertising space. And so I, I see that as a positive yeah you don't really uh want boomers running social media things do you um, no i don't think so i, I don't think, really um, think they get it yeah <laughs> no i mean martin sorrell's outfit i used to hold that and did all right out of that but they've um they've taken yeah they've tanked yeah big star yeah i think they had some trouble getting their accounts out or something didn't they? yeah i can't i can't remember whether it got resolved in the end but it, it did get uh hugely whacked yeah it was in a yeah. stage four downtrend and then right bad news just kept coming yeah i mean in the last brave bison update he said that uh downturn in the economy might actually further accelerate transition to digital in the advertising space which would suit them which is yeah quite a brave call isn't it but i mean the things he said so far have, have proved reliable so mm -hmm. um yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that gets on over the next six months or so. Will people really start raining advertising budgets in? Maybe, maybe mm. so. I don't yeah. have stocks like I just left to see um, sort of more traditional medias. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, there was digital box. I think they expect advertising to slow down, but I think they'll probably be fine. They've got a strong balance sheet. Right, okay. business. I think that's um, probably one of the closest pairs, isn't it? To yeah, but it's yeah, pro probably yeah. Digital vice, uh, digital box and brave vice and similar, similar size, I guess. Yeah. Um, but before before we wrap up, John, um, do you have any things that you would like to share to any new traders? Or you know, we've covered quite a bit of of things that you've learned along the way. But can you think of anything? before we close off um i mean i when i started trading i wasn't on twitter mm -hmm. um so i think that would probably make quite a big difference to the newbie starting out like i mean i'm, I'm probably quite gullible in in some ways um but i think it's quite easy to get a, a handle on, you know, who's just ramping rubbish. Mm. Um, I would say if you're going to use Twitter for advice in inverted commas, follow people who are self-critical, like who hold their hands up when they've made mistakes, who give sort of a balanced appraisal of a, of a trading statement for the stock they hold when it comes out. You know, they're quite happy to say, yeah, revenues have gone up, but margins are getting squeezed a little bit or, Someone's just granted him, been granted loads of options or something like that. So, um, yeah, if somebody's tweeting every five minutes about a stock and then a week later it's never getting mentioned, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably something you should follow. Mm. Um, yeah, Twitter, Twitter's quite handy. Um, I'll, I'll put your Twitter as well below in the thanks. notes. Yeah, um, podcasts are quite a good thing to listen to, I would say. Um, mm. There's loads of information out there and um, really hurts to have a, a listen to stuff like if you're into fitness or like I do a lot of cycling, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts when I'm out on my bike or I'm in the gym or whatever. If you've got hobbies like fishing or whatever, if you can, you know, be digesting information off podcasts when you're doing something else, I find that quite a time efficient way to, to absorb information and gather ideas and stuff. Yeah um yeah that's good that's a good idea yeah don't don't be thin-skinned but be prepared to admit when you are wrong um, mm -hmm. and don't be a, a hostage to sort of your own skin <laughs> and, and, and yeah. things change as well like the you know the the economy and, and the way business is done over ever since sort of covid started we've seen really big shifts in in things and the landscape can change and change back again very quickly like if you not a stock i've really dealt with but if you look at something like ao world um mm -hmm. massive tailwind off the pandemic and then i think we've had yeah. to create it since haven't they um, there's a lot of them uh, grand old probably been like thoughts. the uk's peloton i guess yeah um so yeah assess the landscape um you know do things like look at how if shops are busy when you're walking down a high street or what sort of businesses your local pub doing stuff like that keep your eyes peeled because 
yeah, it's not a benign investing environment at the moment, like ditto energy markets, government interventions and stuff like that. Be on your toes. Like I know there's a lot of people that have made a lot of money out of energy stocks this year and the bright people and I dare say they will continue to make a lot of money out of energy stocks over the next you know, years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just be cognizant that things can change extremely quickly. Yeah. They can. Yeah, I think crowded um, natural gas is probably a crowded trade at the moment. Um, so yeah. any sort of jitter, they're all just going to tank. Um, not saying they won't rally again afterwards. Yeah, but, but then a hot equally, in. what happens if Putin turns off Nord Stream completely, indefinitely? Yeah. It could could go up a lot further. Mm. Um, yeah, government interventions, I think, are a, a big risk and there's a lot of yeah i think so yeah well it's probably a good time to close off now john but yeah thank sure. you very much um, thank you i really appreciate your time i've enjoyed it and um yeah i will put uh, your twitter below so people can follow you on there thank you very much yeah. all the best Michael. thanks a lot john take care bye